Broadcasting from the commodity capital of the world, Zurich, Switzerland, this is Insider's Guide to Energy. This addition to Insider's Guide to Energy is brought to you by Fidectus. Go to www.fidectus.com for more information. Welcome everyone to the mini series Next Generation Energy Leaders of the podcast Insider's Guide to Energy. My name is Luca. And I'm Manu and we are your hosts for today. In today's episode, we are very happy to have with us Pepe Seppala. Pepe is a member of a local council and a part of the Young Green Party in Finland. Finland has recently commissioned the first worst long-term storage facility for nuclear waste. And we are eager to talk to her about the role of nuclear energy in the energy transition. Yeah, I'm uh, very much looking forward to hearing Pepe's take on nuclear energy. Um, she's been on the news for being a green politician favoring nuclear energy. Um, and I've, we thought that's reason enough to have her on the show uh, to, to, to see and hear what she knows and has to say. Um, we just really quickly want to highlight here, um, we, we, we don't stand for a political viewpoint in this podcast. We are just eager to learn about the different technologies and policies out there in the energy industry. Um, so uh, just to put this out there. Indeed, a lot of in exciting topics to cover today. So let's welcome her. Hi, Pepe. It's a pleasure to have us with you today. Hi, great to be here. <laughs> so jumping right in, could you briefly introduce yourself and what you do to the audience? So hi, I'm Pepe Seppala. I'm a leader of Young Greens in Finland, and then I'm a city councillor in Espo, and sounds like a like, well, full-time politician. And then I also study energy engineering at Aalto University. So I actually, this my work, my working work background more than actually my political standpoint. All right. So what made you study energy science? Uh, when I was been little, I have been always like anxious about climate change. And that has been a very big part of like what kind of, how my, I choose my party but also how I choose my studies, because I felt that by studying energy, I can actually make a change and like bigger change than just maybe studying politics or studying biology or something like that. I felt like engineer, engineers actually change the world. So that was mm -hmm. like that part of why I choose energy engineering. Mm -hmm. That's very cool. So, so tell us a bit from, from being a student of energy science to becoming a city councillor. Um, how does that transition go? And also, how did you get into politics uh, in general? Uh, I think it, the transition goes quite smoothly. Uh, in, in that part is Espo doesn't own its own energy company, so I cannot be in the board of energy company. That was like really disappointing, but <laughs> otherwise, <laughs> I feel that it's uh, very good that the politicians have some kind of background other than just politics, because it helps you to understand like what the people who are working on stuff are actually actually doing what is possible, what is not. You are not just running the city by reading some headlines like, OK, I read that there is this kind of technology. Why don't we use it? Mm -hmm. And it's like, yeah, they are developing it. And it's like in 30 years, they can maybe use it, but it's not at the moment. So I've seen a lot of politics just like reading the papers and be like, OK, I know what this stuff is. And I'm like, yeah, I've been studying this for years. It doesn't really work like that. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, so how how does uh, what's like what jurisdictions in terms of energy politics um, go into the let's say into the field of the city councillor? What what kind of what kinds of, of, of things can you decide on actually? Oh, well, we decide how do we heat the city. Okay, that's like the big part because uh, heating in Finland it's like city's responsibility to decide like what kind of um, solution they offer and what kind of uh, faculties you can build inside the city, like can you build nuclear power plant or can you build a coal, coal plant to burn coal or do you build uh, geothermal energy? 
So that's like the planning side of that is part of city's responsibilities, but also the cities use electricity and heat, like what kind of energy we are using inside of the city. And then if we count the fuels as a part of energy, then we go like really big when then it's about transportation and like cars and do we uh, favor public transportation, what kind of roads we build and then it's like, it depends how what the scope is, but it can go like everything about the city is about energy and it's like, I think for me, the society is like how we use energy. Mm. And mm. if you talk about society, it's about politics. So I think they are really combined together and you cannot really talk one without other. Fascinating. What's the plan for the energy mix in your city then? What's the roadmap? We plan to be energy carbon neutral 2035. So mm -hmm. uh, that's, uh, well, that's always like what you count as a part of mm -hmm. like cities' uh, responsibilities. Like are the citizens, what they are buying is that part of the city's responsibility and how they move and that kind of things. Uh, but in Espo, we don't own our own uh, heat production but the Fortum own this and we are uh, doing uh, cooperation with them and the Fortum has planned how they will lower the carbon uh, footprint and the biggest part in the Esco, actually in Espo we actually just approved it uh, we are going to have a data, data center and the data center uses a lot of electricity but by that they also produce a lot of heat and in countries that don't really use uh, need uh, warming then the heat will go just outside but in Finland, because it's a country, we will actually take that heat that is coming from the data center and use it that to heat our, our homes in Finland. <laughs> so that's like big part of how Espo will be carbon neutral. Is, is that data Very center going to be um, part of a, a company or, or how? What? Yeah, it's like Microsoft's ah, data centers. Mm, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And because the Finland has the electricity in Finland is actually quite clean. We don't mm -hmm. use really much coal to produce it. And also Microsoft is going to be more climate neutral, but also, and, we are, and because they are using the heating, that's also like, uh, you can, well, that's a big debate. Like, can Microsoft count it as their climate action or can City of Espo count that for our climate action? If we both, both count it, then we are having a miscalculation because we are counting the same thing twice. So. That's like big debate, but that's like yeah, somebody is actually doing something. <laughs> of course, uh, but do you have uh, any estimations, like how many homes you can heat with uh, such um, a data center? Yeah, it was I think like a third of Espo in the long run wow. can be like he, uh, heated by that because well, it's debat um, will demand a lot of those centers, but still it's like actually quite big and the because the plant, they are actually quite big, the data centers. And of course, it will also look at electricity because they go, of course, you do need some heat pumps and those kind of things, but still it's surprising effort. It's not really uh, like a high temperature in energy stores, but it, because it's producing it quite a lot and uh, constantly. So that's why it actually works quite nice. I think that's funny. Is that, um, do you know if it's part of, um, part of a voluntary carbon market? Can you do this? Um, I think the waste heat is not at the moment part of it because it's more about like what you are using. Okay. So I think this is more about you are reducing the amount of the carbon that you need. Okay. So that's why yes. it helps. And that way, of course, because you don't have to pay that the carbon that price for that. Yes. So that is, but actually we are in Finland, we, uh, we are experienced, we are trying to make a market for also this like carbon reduction, like when you are using something else. Uh, actually this like aftermarket so this is uh, the like new thing that there is not really like political guidance but of course because the carbon has price mm. that's why it's people are increased to use something else than carbon yeah so this is not very this is not the, the, very the focus of this episode but maybe <laughs> still quite interesting um, because i have read quite a few companies in finland are developing um, um business models to to, to produce biochar from, from, from carbon sources, um, from biomass, for example, and then using this um, to, to sell voluntary carbon credits, basically. Uh, yeah. have, you, have you also heard of this? Yeah, I have. It's, um, yeah, it's quite a new thing. It's, I think the market is a little bit like how you count this and what is the plan. And like, uh, I think that's something that we need really to discuss about, discuss about the pricing and how we will make the most efficient like uh, 
personal finance decision because it's always like how you count it and who is actually getting those cuts and how and that's also like a big thing of like where you get the biomass because in Finland we can actually also use the forest to produce like uh, packaging and uh, biofuels is a big thing at the moment like should we instead use the biomass to produce uh, uh, fuels for the cars so that's also something that I think the market will decide what is like the best uh, way to use the material as you think what you get from the price and then also what you uh, what is uh, demanded in the market. Very interesting. Maybe we should uh, move back to the <laughs> yeah, main topic. So let's uh, talk about nuclear power or more specifically like the political acceptance of uh, uh, nuclear power in Finland. What are the special conditions in Finland that made uh, you and your party shift the line on nuclear power? Uh, well, for me personally, I think when I was younger, I was actually against of nuclear power because I read this book, like nuclear power plants are scary and we should be mm -hmm. uh, scared about it. And when the climate change happens, we will all die because of the nuclear waste. But uh, then I started my studies and I actually have to learn how nuclear power plant works. And then when I knew how it works, that then I was like, oh, this is not actually that scary. And well, and then I looked at charts like uh, how if we want to replace all the coal and all the nuclear power plants, we would leave like tons of renewable. So then I figured out it's maybe easier to first replace the like fossil fuels and then maybe talk about how we are going to replace the nuclear power plants, but maybe not to do that same time. So, mm -hmm. but in Finland, uh, there's a lot of like discussion, like what is the difference? Uh, I think one and a couple of the reasons are like Finnish, Finnish people are quite uh, engineering country. Uh, and that's like one thing that at least I think Finnish people want to believe and that's the reason. Uh, the second part is uh, that we like, uh, the system is a bit different. Like actually companies are owning the nuclear power, power plants and that's why it's a little bit different that the government is not owning them. And after that, oh, I have to some point that I forgot it, but, <laughs> but, that, uh, but then it also comes to that, that we have sol solved the uh, storage problem because yes. in a lot of countries, there is no solution for the waste sol problem. And I think for the Finnish people to feel comfortable about nuclear, nuclear waste, the, it helps when you have solution. If you don't have it, I think I would also be a little bit more skeptical, like, okay, we are producing this waste, but we don't have any plan where to put it. So that I think is like one of the main reasons because we have the solution, but also the Finnish uh, companies that have the nuclear, nuclear power plants, they are active, they have in discussion with Finnish people. So they have like this visitor center. I was talking with one guy from Germany and he was like, her, his parents lived next to her, uh, nuclear power plant, but they have never been inside of it. Mm -hmm. But in Olkilua, that they actually have this visitor center, you can go, okay, now you can go because of the virus, but still like normal days, you can just go there. They have like a, a video clip showing like what is inside. They have replicas of the waste uh, barrels of where going to put the nuclear waste and you can like check it out and they will explain like, okay, this is how it works. This is how it looks like. This is what we are doing. This is how we have, uh, prepare for the disasters and they are very open about what they're doing. And I think that helps because it's not like something mystical and dangerous they are doing behind the fence and you cannot know it. They're like, well, hey, welcome, you can come visit us and let's talk about it. So I think for people that really helps to feel more secure and you don't have to be scared of the, like, the, uh, like the, these factories because you actually know how they work. Yes, I mean, and one huge benefit is the, that energy is always provided mm. around the clock compared to renewables. Yes. So I guess in Finland, there is uh, less solar power available, no. but um, <laughs> what, what about wind? Is wind an option for Finland? Yes, it is. Uh, it's actually growing all the time, but uh, the amount of wind power to replace like the fossil fuels is actually quite huge. And then it's the storage is quite big thing, thing like how you will store because in Finland, uh, the winds are like cycles. It's like usually two weeks of wind and two weeks uh, less wind. Of course, it a little bit daily changes, but still like that's like the cycle, like the basically. So the two weeks is quite long time to use the storage systems. So I think if we would 
figure out the good way how to uh, storage the wind power, then it probably would be bigger. But it's also in Finland we have a lot of uh, industry, industry and they actually demand quite a lot of stable energy and they are willing to pay, pay more higher price from the electricity if they know it's stable. So even though if wind energy would be a little bit cheaper, but it's not stable, so then it's not an option for a lot of factories. So that's just like, I think we need both. It's not like one verse or there is still different uses, different solutions, uh, different way of using it. So in the long term, I think the industry will a little bit separate itself from like what can you can use with renewables. Maybe it's some industries you can scale up and down depending about the electricity price. And now they're actually doing it in some factories in Finland. And they just shut the factory down and then they wait that the electricity price goes down. And then maybe some factories will use more like uh, nuclear power plants and they want to like stable price. So that's something that it depends totally what you are doing that if you can do that or not. Yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. one um, critical point is um, if, if I want to be a, a little bit mean now is renewable energies are very, very cheap when it comes to the, the cost of electricity. And and when we when we look at the cost of, of nuclear, um, I mean, you guys have 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 recently commissioned the f world's first long term storage facility for nuclear, but that comes at a price, right? So, so what, what, you, what would you say to someone saying, well, nuclear is just economically completely not viable? Well, I think it's a little bit part of like the politics, mm -hmm. because I think it's not about nuclear or versus renewables. It should be both of them versus uh, 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 fossil fuels. Okay. And the fossil fuels are way too cheap at the moment. So I think it should not be comparing like which of those is too cheap. But I think they should both should be cheaper than the fossil fuels. Okay. Uh, and then I think as well as a politician, I think I shouldn't make that decision, like what is better. I think from my job is to make that the fast, fast factories, the owners, the people who are buying the electricity, they can choose. It's not like I don't have any uh, like uh, favorites and I shouldn't have shouldn't have as a politician yes. because I should be as long as carbon free, as long as it doesn't destroy the nature, yes. it uh, workers are like it's ethical, mm -hmm. then mm -hmm. I think it should be something that the buyer decides what they want to buy. And if True. nobody wants to use nuclear power plants and we can do it without, then that's really good. Like <laughs> I'm not complaining. Yeah. So I think the price discussion is a little bit like it depends about how you use. If you want to have stable energy, then you are willing to pay a little bit more for that security. And if you are okay with the price changing or maybe like and chasing quite much in some cases. So if there's low wind, then the price can go work really high. And if you're willing to take that risk, then that's your business model. I'm not gonna <laughs> make that decision for you. Yes. So there is uh, no subsidizing of nuclear energy in Finland? No. That we have some subsidizes for wind energy, but they are also now like uh, going down. Decreasing. Yeah, yeah. decreasing, yeah. Oh, that is interesting. What about that? You have that, uh, we, we, we've kind of touched upon that uh, storage facility. Um, I think in our pre-call, you mentioned that you actually visited the, the facility. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, I have been there, like down there. <laughs> and how was that? Inside the earth. <laughs> it was quite moist and like uh, deep and it's like, you can actually feel like in your body that you are like really down uh, underground because you can like somehow sense the pressure of like the massive land on top of you. So we didn't go really like in the deepest point, but it was still like, okay, it's a little bit scary. Yeah. <laughs> and for how long, for how long, do you know how long it takes to basically, or how long does, does nuclear waste have to be in there? Well, forever optimizingly, yeah. it's not supposed to come up yeah. uh, when we when the earth exploded or closes or something like that, <laughs> then it might come up. Okay. <laughs> it's not like we put it there and then someday we take it back. It's like you you leave it there and hope like nobody, nothing happens and the earth will, doesn't destroy by an asteroid or something like that. But then I think it's also not a very big problem, even if it, even if it would come out. Do you know anything about the capacity of this uh, storage facility? So it's for all of Finland for hundreds of years or <laughs> how big is the yeah, plan? Yeah, it's uh, 
like from all of Finland, and we have at the moment four uh, nuclear uh, net, uh, no, uh, nuclear uh, <laughs> I forgot the name of the. No worries, no worries. Sorry. No problem. Yeah, so we have uh, four nuclear energy plants, mm -hmm. and the, now at the moment the size of it's uh, called Onkalo. Uh, it's uh, it's it will fit all the ways that those factories will produce in their lifetime. But it's like got this tunnel network, so you can also expand it if there would be like uh, more uh, nuclear nuclear factories. And we actually have the finish, uh, fifth uh, nuclear energy factory. It started running uh, like test run this year, and it should be like ready next year. But and that's also scaled to fit inside of that uh, onkalo. But uh, it's not like the base of the rock formation that it, it uses, it's not really uh, rare in Finland, so you can build the same system as somewhere else, also if it, if it would have more nuclear waste in long time, but at the moment it fits, it fits to all the nuclear waste in, in Finland and what is going to be in the future in, the, in those factories. Yeah. I mean, the most difficult uh, thing is usually finding a place where people accept that it will yeah. be in that place. Like, <laughs> Not the, not in my backyard situation. Mm. So what that was that an issue when they started building this? Uh, it's a, it's in Olkiluoto. It's the same place that there are two of the nuclear and uh, nuclear energy uh, are in Finland. So it's actually well, it's also going to be accept, accepted that there is radiation. So it's not like a new place. But of course, if we would try to build somewhere else, then we would have to have that discussion again. But uh, in Finland. Yeah, I think it depends like where you want to put it, like middle of Helsinki would be really problematic, middle of maybe Lapland, people would be maybe more willing to discuss this uh, scenario. But yeah, it's, it's, this one should fit all, everything, so it's not really a uh, current discussion to have more space. And it's also it's scalable, for more up, scalable, so you can actually store it even more there than it's sc scaled at the moment. I think that is very interesting. What, what, what also comes to my mind is the question of when you have such a long-term facility, how do you make sure that in, let's say, a thousand years, people will actually know that something is there and they shouldn't dig, even though maybe, I don't know, the civilization could completely change and people could be speaking a completely different language. So I think, <laughs> I, I think that's a really funny thought. Uh, to, 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 Maybe that's also included in the planning of the whole uh, facility. It actually has been. Uh, it's like uh, they, I think they one point like some, uh, I think association had like this big uh, planning districts going about like what sign would be readable like after thousands of years. But uh, but I think the basic plan is like nobody should like. Um, why would they dig hole in there? It's not really real place, real place that. It has something like you should go there when I mean, it's uh, finished. You cannot really pinpoint it from the other places. And at least for a thousand years, there's going to be like big trees and that kind of things if uh, somehow there is not any more nuclear power plant. So uh, it's like, why would you dig there? And how would you know there is something? And even if you would dig, uh, it's like fill up, fill up with rocks. So you cannot really just drop inside of tunnels and go wandering, it would be just filled up. So you have to have to dig quite a lot uh, to reach the barrels. So it's not something you can like accidentally reach. And the nuclear waste, it's like, it's dangerous, but uh, most of it will be like the low radiation, uh, what you comes after you destroy the factor, uh, power plant. And it's just maybe cement and concrete, and it has, yeah, it's maybe a little bit radiation, but not something that it would actually harm you. So the most dangerous thing is a nuclear, uh, like, like the rods, rods of like the high, high radiation waste, and amount of that is not going to be that big. And even if you would uh, stumble on them and Probably if you would eat them, I think you might die. But if you would uh, drink water that has come uh, through those rods, then you might get ca cancer, but okay. like might get cancer. So it's not like uh, super dangerous, like, OK, there is going to be people with four heads and or like Mad Max <laughs> style of things. So I think the way about like how dangerous the waste is, is quite over exaggerated and 
in Finland, we actually have Radon in our uh, like a base, base rock. And that is actually causes a lot of cancers in Finland because people don't have proper insulation in their basement and they actually get ra radon uh, radiation. And that's why they get cancer in their lungs. So uh, I think it would be a little bit more similar to that. And it's not like we are constantly checking, checking like, oh, how is your ra radon inside of your house? Mm -hmm. <laughs> So I think it's funny, like this is something like maybe thousands a year you are going to have this and still it's, I think it's more about do we have soci society in thousand years because of the climate change. Manu, do you have any questions? Yeah, I mean, this, this sounds great that you have this uh, <laughs> facility, <laughs> so, but you, you would not, um, there are not plans to I mean, it's also not allowed by international law, probably to ship around nuclear waste. But if you would have like a big facility and other countries don't, um, uh, there are no plans of um, also taking in nuclear waste from other countries. Well, yeah, it's illegal. So <laughs> not really big plans at the moment. Um, but personally, uh, I have thought about this, like how would I feel about that idea? I think it depends how much they would pay. Uh, that's like, maybe we can just everybody quit our jobs and live with that money in Finland. I think people would be very like liking this idea, yeah. but <laughs> if it wouldn't be that big amount, I think it really depends like what countries, how is transportation done? It, it, would it feel safe? Uh, like, could it be it has some problems because every time you move it, then it's more like uh, cases that you can have accident and it doesn't go as planned. But uh, the system that we have in Finland, it's not like you couldn't do in also other parts of Europe. So I think that is like the big discussion for the countries that have nuclear power plants. Like, how what are they going to do with the waste? And also in public, like what we feel that is enough. I think the Finnish solution is quite good, like the best we can have, like below that we just uh, ship, take a spaceship and send it to the, uh, like uh, out of the, out of the, out of this earth. So if we don't send it to space, then I think it's best to bury it under. Which has been suggested. No? Yes. <laughs> Some people think, but uh, again, if yeah. it goes, something goes wrong there. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's like more dangerous if it's explosed and it's actually, I think it could be more like the nuclear test that they have in the atmosphere fair before the World War II. So yeah, I think the boring is the best solution, but then I think it's like debate, like what kind of rock formation is uh, good enough and uh, how much can it cost? And of course, like in countries that are small people, like where you can actually bury it and where you can make, make this uh, Caves. So, yeah, I think that might be discussion in the long run in the future and when the other countries have has their discussion because I think not all of the countries that have nuclear power plants are actually even having this discussion. And mm -hmm. I think, yeah, that's a little bit worrying that you have this waste and you are not actively like finding a solution how to, how to deal with that. Sure. So you mentioned that uh, now just recently a new facility will go online. So uh, nuclear seems to have a bright future in Finland, but um, we also wanted to have a, a bit uh, a talk about uh, energy independence. Um, I mean, you are still dependent on uranium when you have nuclear power. Mm -hmm. So what do you think about this? We actually have uh, uranium mine in Finland. Uh, it's mm -hmm. not that rare element, so actually can be found in Finnish ground, but we don't have the facility to reach make it like the nuclear power uh, like the fuel so uh, that's why we don't use our own but it's not like impossible but I think uh, the place where you make the fuel should be very secure and maybe not in all the countries because that's like the really close steps to make uh, nu uh, nuclear weapons so uh, not yeah I think that's something we should be really uh, concerned about like who is doing the nuclear fuel, but uh, yeah, the uranium is like, but it's uh, at the moment we are actually buying it from, we were buying it from Russia. Uh, we have uh, storage for a couple of years for the factory, so it does, it's not like we accurately need to buy more. Uh, so, but probably we'll buy somewhere else. Uh, it is possible to switch the producer of like where you buy it. 
so yeah um so it's like yeah in a way it's not like as independent but i feel it's a lot less uh dependent on other countries if you compare the fossil fuels and then mm-hmm. if you think about solar panels wind turbines it's not like finnish we have all the material for that in, inside of our borders yeah. so i think in current days it's not like any energy you can be fully independent on every on the other countries or maybe then if you are china then yes maybe yeah. uh, but after that like all the countries are some way dependent on other but i think it's more how often do you need to be in the dependent on other countries if it's like between couple of years so if it's like weekly call and um, panels today so an hour it's like the gas that you actually have like the pipe coming from russia and if they shut it down you are cr- immediately mm. running out mm. so yeah i think it's like um yeah it's it's, it's, a, it's a debate like what is enough what is not <laughs> yeah i mean i mean you're right it's, it's always um the solution doesn't always have to be fully perfect it just needs to be a lot mm. better and that's that can be yeah. applied to many things i think especially in the renewable sector um maybe switching gears here a little bit um you said you're a city councillor um and part of the green party um what does so, so we talked a little bit about your work as, as a city councillor what's your work um in the green party like what what do you do there exactly well i'm like in all the meetings mm-hmm. where they are discussing like what is our stand on stand on this issue and and I can well, voice my opinion and that way I try to change others' opinion or change mine if other ones has better uh, opinions than mine was. So I think it's a lot of like just discussing and thinking about what is the green, green way in every situation. I think in between pandemic and now about the war, so there's a lot of like we have to really think uh, we can like new ways how to make be green in this situation. Yeah. So that's like a big thing like just having discussion and trying to find the best way solution a lot of really bad ones is that is that uh, on the national level yes yeah. Okay. Yeah. i mean you mentioned it uh, a bit what you think like the uh, current events have uh, influenced uh, the acceptance mm-hmm. of nuclear power in finland even more or mm, i think that's like people are they are quite the same place where they started. Uh, the mm-hmm. bigger is like the fossil fuels, like that is has been a big step. Like people are like, mm-hmm. okay, we cannot be depending on Russia and we cannot finance Russia's for wars by buying the, the fossil fuels from Russia. So uh, that's a big shift. And then I think uh, people are then uh, like pro nuclear or against nuclear problems, and then they feel like, okay, we can use renewables or we can use something else or we can use nuclear power plants to make that shift from Russia's fossil fuels. But that's uh, like the debate, like it's still quite strong, I think. And of course, we have this like this sixth uh, nuclear power plant that is like planning to build, but that's it has been actually with Russia. And that's popularity has tanked. So, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so we are actually starting one nuclear power plant like uh, down, but it's not hasn't been like started building or anything. It has been just like planned. But I think we are not going to give it permit to, to build it because mm. it would be built by Russian in Finnish ground. So yeah, not going to happen. <laughs> mm-hmm. But I think generally it's we don't see it as a part of like nuclear power plants. It's just like this one project that has been done with Russia and it's, yeah, it's not done. Okay. okay. So, yeah, so the energy demand in, is currently still increasing because another thing would be to, if we can reduce the amount of energy we need, so increase efficiency. Are there, do you see any potential there or are there specific plans also maybe in your work where you have projects on energy efficiency uh, yes of course i think it's like one part of solution and i think when it comes to energy it's always like there was a lot of solution and when they come together then we will have the final solution but it's not like being energy efficient is going to solve everything but of course it uh, saves you money uh, it's a smart thing to do so why not do it when you can but then it's also quite 
quickly comes like what is uh, useful, what is not, and then it's a debate about who needs this many uh, shoes, should we have like only two kind of shoes and optimize that production and then we come like really quickly at like what people can buy and what they cannot mm -hmm. and that's really <laughs> maybe not go there in that discussion like what you feel is uh, I think uh, Formula 1 is like totally useless so let's save energy and shut that down but I think there's a lot of people who don't agree with me yeah. But in general, it's a smart thing to do. It saves money, it saves resources. So every place we can do it, we should. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Um, Manu, we, I think uh, we have a few uh, questions that we always like to ask. Maybe, maybe you want to start with the first one. Exactly, yes. So I mentioned to you and your, your work, you have uh, different types of work. So what do you like? What, do you, what fulfills you and what motivates you in your daily work? Um, I think it's like I can actually make a change uh, in the world. So you can actually uh, get some idea, try to promote it to other people, and finally you can see that it's, it's a law or it's the sense of your party and a lot of people are agreeing with it and trying to make the change. Mm -hmm. And of course, our party has been always like trying to stop the climate change. So every day that you feel that like you're actually doing something to make a change and actually stopping the climate change and trying to make uh, using fossil fuels like out loud mm -hmm. so i think that uh, makes you feel that you're actually doing something cool that's fascinating um maybe we, we we have another question that we always like to ask our guests and and that's um if you could beam yourself back to being just a, a recent graduate or or what what recommendations or what would you give on the on the way of someone just entering the industry or entering the political field um things that you will give them on the way to, to, to some recommendation of the sort uh, i would recommend to study something like concrete and actually mm -hmm. Excel something and maybe not politics. <laughs> well, at least for me, I think it works better that I actually have career. I actually have some knowledge about things that we are deciding and not just generally. I know the history of all the political parties mm. and I know how we came up in this situation. Mm. And more like I know the industry. I work in a lot of like factories mm. and actually having to understand what is possible, what is not, uh, how these things are used. And that kind of understanding, I think that's uh, valuable when you are actually making legislation, when you know what is physically possible. And it's just like, well, I think it would be ideal if it would work like this. But then it's like, yeah, it doesn't. No. So for me, it's like study something real work, real places, uh, not just inside of the government, yes. uh, go to factories, yes. or like all sorts of things, like other than politics, and then go to politics and then you actually know something. <laughs> Well said. <laughs> so, Luca, do you have uh, any more questions? No, I'm all, I'm all, um, I'm all finished. I, I, I had all my interesting points, uh, all my points um, answered. Thank you very much. Yeah. So I think uh, we're coming to an end. Thank you so much, Peppy, for being on the show. It has been a great pleasure talking with you. Yeah. Thanks, you for inviting me. This has been excellent discussion. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, it's been very insightful. Um, I'm looking forward to hearing more from you in the future um, and for our listeners thank you so much for joining us today and remember to like and subscribe to our show we're looking forward to talking to you soon goodbye <laughs>